Welcome to Book Rising, a podcast by the Radical Books Collective. Hello and welcome. We have Sitsi Dangaremba, Zimbabwean novelist, filmmaker and activist in our studio today for our podcast, The Book Rising, which rhymes with uprising. This is the Radical Books Collective a uh, program that is creating progressive conversations uh, on writing, publishing, and books. Uh, Sitsi, welcome today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Bhakti. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, so there have been a lot of things happening for you in terms of prizes, acclaim, celebration uh, of your work. Of course, uh, you know, um, someone like me and many fans like me have always known of your work and have read your work and um, engaged with your work. Uh, but now we are seeing much more international acclaim. You've recently won the Penn Pinter Prize, which is awarded to a writer, uh, not only for outstanding literary merit, but also for an unflinching, unswerving gaze upon the world. Um, and which uh, they ask that this person shows fierce intellectual determination to define the real truth of our lives and our societies. This award is often paired with the International Writer of Courage Award. So it tends to become a very political award awarded for political uh, activism and merit. Um, and you're such a deserving recipient of this prize. Um, and before we dive into uh, your literary and artistic work, I thought this would be an excuse for you to tell us what has led up to this moment, what is the activism uh, that you've been involved in, and what are the issues you've been highlighting and exposing that have finally caught the world's eye? Bhakti, I live in Zimbabwe. I see myself as an ordinary Zimbabwean citizen and my daily routine is really a mess. It's such a huge challenge each and every day. Just issues of personal hygiene, the normal things, getting a meal, switching on electricity when you need a light, those are all often major challenges. And I think to myself, if I don't have water, if I don't have electricity, if I see prices going through the roof and inflation going up and never coming down, and it actually impacts my life negatively, and I am one of the better off people in Zimbabwe, what does that mean for other people? At the same time, it does impact my life so intensely that I cannot work. If I have issues with electricity, I cannot work. And so I thought that rather than just sit amongst, amidst all, this, all these problems that we have, I needed to do something about it. So basically, I am someone who is on social media, generally on Twitter. And so last year, when some people wanted to have a big demonstration, I thought this was a wonderful idea. I thought, finally, we can all do something together. Instead of just keeping quiet and suffering, we can all just stand up and say, well, things ought to be better. So I joined this demonstration. <laughs> Little did I know that this was going to be perceived as being an activist. For me, it's common sense. If you live in a situation like that, and the people who have been voted in, who are being paid by your money as a taxpayer, are failing to deliver, one needs to tell them that you are failing to deliver. One needs to tell them in a legal manner, in a peaceful manner, but in a very decided manner so that the message gets through. And so since then, um, I have just kept up my interrogation of the way the authorities behave here. And of course, uh, I have mentioned the things that affected me as an individual, but there are many other issues. Uh, there are instances of journalists being imprisoned for the kinds of stories that they publish, their instances of people being tortured uh, for, press, uh, for expressing dissent, their instances of people being expropriated from their land so that 
companies can come into mind. Uh, these are often Chinese companies, and often these mining enterprises take place with no regard. Uh, but of course, uh, because I suppose you're well known, or perhaps uh, you're a woman, uh, you were uh, immediately taken into custody. Um, and, um, you know, and it, and it sort of became quite dangerous. In fact, for us to even organize uh, this, this recording was hard because you have all these dates that you have to appear in courts and so on. Uh, what what was that experience? And it's not over. Yes, so. Bhakti, I really do. No, it, the, the experience is not over. And yes, I do think that the universe is conspiring to make the situation in Zimbabwe known because it just so happened that the date of the demonstration last year, which was July 31, coincided with the announcement of the long list of the Booker Prize. And I had been long listed for the Booker Prize on the 28th. And so that meant that my name was already in the international press. And so when some local journalists filmed the fact that I had been arrested, they sent this news out and it was immediately picked up. And those journalists were only filming me because of the long listing for the Booker Prize. So I take no responsibility. That was the universe doing its thing. Um, yes, I, I spent one night uh, at the police station, in the cells at the police station, which was extremely unpleasant. And very fortunately for me, uh, there was a huge outcry at my arrest. And that led, I believe, to my being given bail the next day. And since then, I have been to court many times, and the state has not been ready with its case. My next date was meant to be tomorrow, but they suddenly imposed COVID regulations, so I'm in quarantine now, so I cannot go to court tomorrow. And so I'm waiting to hear from my lawyers when my next date will be. Wow, uh, sounds like it'll be a long journey and, uh, you know, often unproductive and bureaucratic and made to make your life difficult uh, in a way. That's how I think the system tends to work. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in, in what you said before about the fact that you got long listed for the booker and then the next thing, next, next thing you know, suddenly the spotlight was on you um, and, and things kind of altered. So in a way, um, uh, you know, they did themselves in <laughs> by focusing on you and now the whole cause has been amplified. Uh, but it reminds me also of the fact um, that as a writer, uh, you're a very engaged writer, you're a courageous writer, you used that particular position to expose and highlight some of the things that were, were going on. Uh, and I think this is I think this is unique at this point in time uh, in our current moment, particularly in the West, which still tends to hold the reins to literary circuits and publishing. I think we are we have moved very far from the call for what is called engaged literature or literature of commitment that was made popular by people like Jean Paul Sartre after the Second World War and insisted that writers and artists take their political social responsibilities. Uh, seriously. Uh, what do you think of, of this idea at the moment? Bhakti, I don't really see myself as an engaged writer as such. I see myself who is interested in the people around me. I am interested in the lives of the people around me. I am interested in whether the people around me are living good lives, dignified lives, whether they feel that they are able to self-actualize and realize some of their dreams. And the situation in Zimbabwe is sadly that this is not the case. So I like to have characters that are recognizable to other Zimbabweans. And I like to analyze these characters for their successes and failures. I like to investigate what enables them to achieve what they want to achieve and what stops them from achieving these things. 
and basically it's the structure of society. In Zimbabwe, there is not so much room for individual failure because society is constructed in such a way that an individual abuts against society with every single move. And this comes, of course, from the relationships and the relations of colonialism that we had in Zimbabwe up until 1980, which is not that long ago. And we now live in um, a, a post-colony, a state where the relations of colonization have simply changed content but have not changed form. And so people are abutting against the same kinds of structures that preclude their progress as before. And so when I accompany my characters through their lives of effort and struggle to become the best human being that they can become, I inevitably have to describe these structures only. Sometimes I wish I did live in a different environment where I could tell different kinds of stories, but I don't. I'm here and I write about people. And so those are the kinds of stories that I do produce. Absolutely. Yet I, I, I would like to argue a little bit here with you. Uh, people do produce literature that does not have to engage in the way that you do. Uh, that that is not necessarily uh, committed to uh, the precise issues that you outline. So you know, for example, your trilogy, uh, particularly this vulnerable body, doesn't shy away from articulating and complicating questions of gender and women's rights in Zimbabwe. Uh, and I think um, you know, while we have a ton of literature being produced, escapist literature, fun literature. Um, you know, just, just things that are not necessarily uh, committed to trying to, um, trying to represent the precise problems in society. Uh, you have managed to combine storytelling and the craft of writing, uh, the craft of the novel, uh, while remaining um, extremely engaged with exposing political issues, particularly uh, gender issues, um, in the society that you live and work in, um, how how do you how do you succeed in doing that? How do you succeed in 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 the politics and the craft? Bhakti, there are two sentences that were really formative for me um, as a young writer and as a young woman. First of all, as a young feminist. I, of course, was really impressed by the feminist slogan, the personal is political. And then as a writer who did not have any training in creative writing, I read around to find answers to questions I had about craft. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I read is that good writing introduces a new kind of character to the world. And so really, those are the two guiding principles. I write about people, mm -hmm. and I am very sure that I want the people I write about to be recognizable. So far, I have done this in a realist manner, but at the moment, I'm writing a young adult speculative. Wow. And I want this to be the case, even though the world is speculative, I want people to be able to recognize the struggles that the character is going through. And so this is central for me to concentrate on the person, to concentrate on character. A lot of people say that my writing uh, is not very accomplished in terms of plot. Well, that's fine. Uh, for me, my intention is to take a character from one point to an end point and to understand why this character moves through their world in the way that they do so that their development takes the trajectory that it does. And really that is the point of departure for my mm -hmm. work. 
-hmm. and everything else flows from there. That's wonderful. I didn't know you had detractors who said that. <laughs> about your <laughs> about your capacity to write plot i mean nervous condition is only consistently read and assigned and also at the level of craft always considered uh, an extremely uh, important uh, work um, and you know so that that doesn't make sense to me but i see i see i see what you're saying that uh, the way you map plot is more um is is less about several events unfolding but more through the trajectory of a singular protagonist or in this case two protagonists which is nyasha and tambuzai uh but uh, i think you do a wonderful job um you know you said that you, you had you were uh, you were struck by uh the personal is political and just to kind of uh, play a bit of devil's advocate there you know that this exact mantra has become a way to sell t-shirts and sell brands. And, you know, uh, it's enough to do, it's enough to kind of have attitude and to just, uh, you know, uh, embody uh, feminist uh, <laughs> thinking and activism through hashtags or through, uh, through clothing and so on. So, uh, you know, there's something that has gone awry as well uh, with uh, with those types of ideas, uh, though of course I think I don't think uh, this is the case uh, with you. I think you've taken it to its kind of uh, you know uh, exemplary end. But uh, I just I just I just wonder you know there are not many writers like you. I know you uh, keep saying you're ordinary and you're just doing doing what you feel compelled to do. But I think we live in fairly perilous times, and I think we're reminded of this again and again. We have climate change, immense political upheaval, displacement, war, violence, um, and so on. But do you feel that there is a proportionately serious and engaged response from fellow artists, writers, filmmakers today? Bhakti, that really is a huge question. <laughs> And it, you, this last bit of the question ties in with what you said earlier about slogans on T-shirts. Mm -hmm. We live in a capitalist world where everything that has value is turned to profit. And so, of course, if somebody sees that a particular slogan with its real content is gaining value in a community, in a society, then that slogan is going to be turned to profit. And in that process, the actual meaning of that slogan for the community or the society is going to be eradicated because now the value lies in profit and not in meaning. So that is the world we live in. So for me, I have taken the decision that I'm not going to be dismayed when that happens. I am going to expect it. So mm -hmm. similarly, I think it is not very easy for writers to avoid that process of being appropriated by capital. Because at the end of the day, writers need to eat. And in order to eat, you have to write what people will read. Mm -hmm. People can only read what is published and set before them that they can buy. And so again, what is published and set before people is controlled by capital. And so we are going to see certain stories being selected and other stories being neglected. And so I would not want to blame writers in any way for turning their ability and their craft and their talent to those stories that will be selected. Having said that, I think that there is growing understanding in the world of publishing that this is happening. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there is pushback. Uh, people of letters, serious people who are concerned about the world we live in and are concerned that we leave a legacy for our descendants, realize that those kinds of contents which are determined by that system of value that is designed only for profit in the absence of meaning mm -hmm. cannot provide that security 
not for us and not for forthcoming generations or for any other creation on the world. And they are becoming aware that we have to change things and start talking about meaning and creating new progressive sustainable meanings for ourselves. And so I think that this kind of thinking, this movement will increase. Of course, it will look different to the kinds of meanings that were engaged with by writers in the 1960s, the Sartres, as you mentioned. But I think that we will be in a new rung of the spiral. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm not at all hopeless. And I think that all the processes that we see now are simply the drive that will keep us spiraling upwards. Absolutely. Um, I agree. And I think we've had some evidence of that uh, uh, recently with the types of writers that were chosen to be rewarded, whether we're thinking of Abdul Razak Gurna or, or you, or even uh, Babakar Boris Diop from Senegal. Uh, so I see, I see how you're, I see that you're, the hope that you're articulating, uh, uh, you know, it come, it's, it's very real. I think that comes from a real place. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, caught my eye in a way uh, with, with your answer is also the way in which capitalism co-ops co everything. It takes everything and turns it into a product. One of the more pernicious uh, effects of, uh, of capitalism and corporatization uh, in publishing has been a kind of manufactured divide between literature and politics. And you yourself said that your work was criticized uh, for something to do with plot or something to do with form. Um, and I do wonder if there is still an operating logic in circulation that political writing is bad writing. I still come up uh, I still come up uh, against this uh, once in a while that there is there is there is sort of political writing and then there's good good writing good literature or a good film or a political film. So I just wonder, um, what do you think about this 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 idea? Is it still present? I do think that the idea exists, and I do think that I understand where it comes from. I think that really remaining faithful to a point of view that is founded in a progressive kind of humanity is not always the easiest point of departure for narrative because narrative is craft. It's all about form. It's all about structure. And so I think that often simply because it is so hard and the messages are so urgent. People tend to produce their product and distribute it before it really has reached the highest perfection that it could reach. I think what's also important here is to remember that that kind of project often is not funded mm -hmm. because there is this tendency to want to finance commercial products. So people who want to produce that kind of narrative work under very challenging conditions. So I think that is one of the reasons. And I think it's therefore it's really important for me to understand the conditions under which people work when evaluating mm -hmm. the products. And in that way, we can also make cases for directing more funds towards that kind of enterprise. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there might be reasons for that. And I do think that funding is one of the key reasons. Yeah, absolutely. The conditions within which the work is produced, uh, uh, the amount of time and amount of space you've had for reflection and rewriting and revising, of course, must make such a huge difference for any kind of uh, writing or artistic uh, process. Uh, and I do think that the idea of the mad genius imprisoned and just scribbling away the most brilliant uh, lines of poetry and so on uh, is a bit of a romantic construct uh, that, we, that, that we also subscribe to. Um, but, uh, you know, do you want to, want to name a few 
writers, artists, or filmmakers that you believe produce political work that's also very inspiring to you uh, at a level of form? Um, you know, do any writers, books, novels, films come to mind? Well, Bhakti, before I engage with that, I also just wanted to say something about capitalism. Um, I sure. do not think that the form of capitalism that we see operating now is the only form of capitalism. You know, sometimes when we look at economies, mm -hmm. we think that economies are natural systems. And in fact, up until very recently, the study and what they call the science of economies, economics, has also assumed that. But in fact, economies are man-made creations. They are something that have emanated from the behavior and the cognition of human beings. Mm -hmm. So they are totally within our control. So if we don't like a particular version of capitalism, we can change it. Right. And so um, I don't even really have a very big distinction between socialism and capitalism. I think a system is only as good as the people who run it. Absolutely. Uh, you know what, this reminds me of, uh, you know, when they make arguments about um, abolishing the police uh, and recently read a very good book um, by Gio Maher uh, about abolishing the police. And one of the things they say is that this is, uh, this is the first thing that has to happen is the imagination. You know, we used to live uh, within monarchic systems and we were ruled by kings and queens uh, and thought that was the only system. But here we are now you know things had there has been a systemic shift over time that the first the first work you do is the work of imagining uh something something different so that you know that's i think in a way i feel that's what you're you're saying perhaps yes absolutely i'm a huge believer in the imagination i also believe that the imagination is something that is determined by our experiences we cannot imagine the new without the old to know that we to prompt us to know that we need something new. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's really important for us to be magnanimous in a way and gentle with what we have now, because surely it's not the best, but it is what will point us to the better. And um, so this is why extremism of any nature is something that is really quite foreign to the way I look at the world because I feel that everything that we are witnessing now are things that we have to come to terms with. Right. So if I simply refuse to engage with something, there will never be any way to move whatever I am refusing to engage with onto a better path. I have to engage with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Um, should, should we return to my uh, question about uh, uh, writing art that uh, inspires you, that is political as well as artistically inspiring and exciting? Yes. Recently, <laughs> Bhakti, I have not been reading much of that kind of literature. I read a lot of it when I was a, a young woman in the 1980s and 1990s. And that was, of course, the African classics, Ngugi, um, mm -hmm. Hinoa Achebe, later on, Zakes Mda, writers like that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I read African-American women also, uh, all the well-known names. Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, and also the Afro-American Caribbean women, Paul Marshall, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But what I have found recently is that a lot of the fiction has migrated from the continent. And so I find the articulation of these from the diaspora, especially. Um, somewhat removed from what I see as necessary telling for the conditions 
of at least southern Africa, where I live, and where the, the history has been quite common. So I've started reading more nonfiction than uh -huh. fiction. And there are a couple of names that have really blown my mind um, recently. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenda Andrews with his The New Age yes. of, uh, uh, yes, The New Age of Imperialism. Mm -hmm. um, um, Reni Edo Lodge, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. <laughs> yes. Um, Vijay Banerjee, a book about why um, peasant, the conditions that determine the success or failure of peasant rebellions. And so that's the kind of literature that I'm reading right now. Okay. Um, I, I am actually looking for what I call transcendent literature now. Mm -hmm. And that is the kind of writing that I want to go into. I find that I am reading a lot of articles about the history of Southern Africa. One of them was a book called The Cowboy Capitalist mm. uh, by Charles uh, Olson, a South African historian, which really was mind blowing. It was about how the mining engineers from the United States of America in the 19th century, mm -hmm. latter part of the 19th century, came to South Africa and became immensely wealthy as um, very skilled technicians, uh, directors of mines, uh, due to the experience that they had mm -hmm. in, for example, the silver mines in Idaho. And um, they actually were called landlords, you know, so I, I'm, I'm trying to piece together the histories and to understand how we have come to have such an enduring system based on racialization of human beings. So that's where I am at the moment. And yeah. I'm looking at it from where I sit in Zimbabwe, in Southern Africa, in Africa, in the mm -hmm. world. And, you know, Alice Walker said that she put herself at the center of, of her narrative and didn't budge. Wow. And so that is exactly what I am trying to do. So now I find that reading a lot of narrative that really um, is not concerned with me being at the center. Wow. Okay. is narrative that displaces me from the center in my own mind. And so mm -hmm. I am really selective about what I read at the moment. And this is why what you're calling transcendent. This is why you use the word transcendent. No, transcendent is what I'm aiming at. Okay. I'm hoping I that when I have gathered enough knowledge, I will I be able to meld all of that into a whole that can speak to these issues. Yes, it's really ambitious, but I'm beginning to see that unless we start talking together, all of us, we are not going to solve the problems that need to be solved that affect us all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I can't imagine a, a better person to take on a project like this, and I wish you all success. Uh, I want to pivot our conversation a little bit to African literature, uh, African cultural production. Uh, and here we can define African literature in its broadest sense possible from the continent, from the diaspora, uh, from colonial and indigenous uh, uh, languages and so on. Um, and I think uh, I often, I find that when it comes to African literature, readers, scholars, uh, reviewers often focus on the political and social themes uh, of the work. They tend to comment less on aesthetic um, and formal elements uh, of the writing. I think this is certainly, uh, I can vouch as someone who works uh, as an instructor and a teacher in this, uh, in this world, this is to be true. Uh, why do you think African literature has ended up uh, being pigeonholed in this particular way? I think 
that African literature tends to be pigeonholed in that way because the publishing industries and the whole idea of literature itself in the published form and the whole all the notions of aesthetics mm -hmm. are in fact western they do not proceed from africa they do, do not proceed from an african consciousness they do not proceed from african methods of narration they do not proceed from african um, verbal narrative aesthetics mm -hmm. and so when publishers are looking for ways into the literature what is probably more accessible to them is the notion of a literature proceeding from a continent that has been disadvantaged politically mm -hmm. so again it, it is basically the european framing of discourse and all forms of narrative within that discourse it's probably asking answering the question how can we understand and frame this african narrative and the answer would be oh yes that is the narrative that comes from the disadvantaged continent because right. that is how africa is seen so right. that is what contributes to that framing mm -hmm. and then because of the relations between africa and europe most Europeans do not have any real understanding of the African symbolic world, the African narrative world. Mm -hmm. They may be able to narrate things about it, but right. that does not mean that they have their own internal symbolic understanding of it. So there is a disconnect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so this is one, yeah, this is one reason why we see certain kinds of narratives being prioritized. Um, for example, slavery. Everybody knows about slavery. It's been admitted that slavery was not the best thing to happen, was wrong, shouldn't have happened or whatever. And so if you write about slavery, you are writing into uh, a, a known discourse and so people can recognize it mm -hmm. what is known about the ordinary lives of africa what is known about the rhythms of africa in those circles that evaluate narrative that has been published very little as i was saying so i think this is part of the reason now it's compounded by the fact that we on the continent Mm -hmm. are also educated in those ways of thinking of course and so we also evaluate ourselves in that way and because we are concerned with being accepted so that we can be published or so that we can be said to be literate people who have read the right things mm -hmm. we do not give ourselves the scope and we are not given the scope to explore our creativity in its fullness Mm -hmm. And so until Africans on the continent are willing to invest in their own creative worlds, I do not think that that is really going to change. A good example is Nollywood. Mm. Nollywood is not about political issues. Nollywood is about African people doing their African thing as they do it every day. And the whole of the African diaspora <laughs> has responded to that wherever that wherever there are people of african diaspora they are watching that narrative mm -hmm. but it doesn't get that kind of critical acclaim that you mentioned i so, remember in the 90s when nollywood took the world by storm there were so many panels on nollywood <laughs> at international film festivals all over the world right did those people who are responsible for buying content actually buy that right. Nollywood content. No, they didn't. So it was just, again, to talk about, to spectate, to objectify. 
but not to really engage with. So uh, this is the situation that we are at. And it is really only a situation that can be rectified by us. Something else that is happening that I think is really positive, and I have been a beneficiary of this, mm -hmm. is that we have people from the continent now who are working in many different kinds of places all over the world. And so they are bringing their continental sensitivity. Mm -hmm. They have achieved high professional ranks wherever they are working. So when people in these other parts of the world ask them and say, well, what do you think about this? They can give their opinion and they can also talk about editing processes to make that work a work that will cross over from African to European. And right. I think we are seeing more of that. And I think that's very positive because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, history has progressed in the way that it has. And so we are not going to go backwards. We do have to find ways of going forwards that are inclusive and that sustain diversity also. Wow, thank you. That's a, that's a great long answer. And I had all these questions, but I think you've all already um, answered them. Uh, do you want to just say a little bit more about uh, films? I, I always, uh, you know, I'm trying to hold space for you as, as a filmmaker. You're a talented filmmaker and you do a lot for the film industry in trying to uh, resurrect and pump energy into uh, African collaborative filmmaking projects. Uh, though I think the attention tends to be much more on you as a writer. So um, I think we can say that something is changing for African literature, given the prizes, uh, given the fact that, you know, uh, nervous conditions, even though it was widely taught and read, uh, didn't receive the same kind of acclaim, attention, uh, you know, nominations as this mournable body did. It was evidence that things are changing. Are things changing for African films and filmmakers as well? I do agree, Bhakti, that things are changing for African literature. And yes, I have lived it. I uh, embody that change when I think of the way my writing as a young mm -hmm. woman was received and the way my writing is received now. And I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I feel that film is lagging behind. And one of the big reasons why it is lagging behind is that it is because it involves a lot of capital. You need a lot of money to make a film that is technically skilled, sufficiently mm -hmm. so that people will want to watch it. Even Nollywood that I mentioned earlier began making films that were terrible technically and they <laughs> had to improve their technique in order to get audiences because mm -hmm. you're competing against the big guys in Bollywood and Hollywood and mm -hmm. elsewhere. And so really uh, finances are the limiting factor in film. And the people who hold the finances are people who have a vested interest in the world continuing in the same manner because that is the manner that has rewarded them with all this money. So they are not really going to want to invest in stories that disrupt the status yes. quo. Mm -hmm. So it, it is very difficult for film. And I personally have not seen any improvement really where money is meted out to African filmmakers. I see it as tokenism. Mm -hmm. um, I see it again as African filmmakers thinking, well, what will sell? And very unfortunately, what sells in African filmmaking is still very much using uh, the black body as an object of spectatorship, uh, as a location of spectacle, and not as a subject with aspirations mm -hmm. working to realize those aspirations. Those kinds of films are hardly ever funded. In fact, really, there, there are so few and far between that any time I try to think of one, I am really hard put <laughs> to think of one. 
Oh, it is changing, yeah, especially with more and more African American films being made mm -hmm. and uh, African American people putting their own money into into film and also allies. There are always people who understand that a world can only function well if it functions well for all of us. But mm -hmm. I think it will take much longer because I do believe that the pressures uh, to, to maintain the status quo are very powerful indeed. Absolutely. I mean, film is just such a high volume uh, production. I mean, it's, it takes so many people. It's just very hard to produce, uh, you know, beautiful long works, feature film type of work, uh, you know, uh, without a crew, without all the equipment. So yeah, the finances is the biggest issue. And then of course there are the uh, diversification, agents of diversification that are indeed very extractive and uh, you know, uh, only kind of engage black persons, uh, black characters uh, as part of a side, as part of a, as part of a side uh, um, coterie of uh, characters that are, uh, you know, to the plot and so on. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of problems and I think the changes will come, but much, much slower perhaps than, than literature. Uh, you are, you know, we had a conversation a couple of years ago where you said you were writing a work of speculative uh, fiction. Um, how far along are you? Is it coming soon? What do you hope to accomplish with switching to a different audience and a different form? Final question. Yes, Bhakti. I just wanted to make one more point about film. Sure. Um, if you can imagine that you have a black sensitivity on a page of literature, at least you are in control. You can think about it, you can stop, you can go off and read and then maybe come back to it when you're ready. And this applies to any book. It isn't only about black people. Now, the thing about a film is that it's meant to grab you and it's meant to keep you hooked for its full duration. Mm -hmm. That is how film is meant to function. So you, a person has an image of what a black person should be. And then suddenly that image comes alive and starts talking back at you for 90 minutes without stop. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, I have a scene that speaks to that in this mournable body mm -hmm. when a woman is being uh, photographed by a German tourist. And she jumps at the tourist and she grabs his camera and says, well, look at what your picture is doing now. I mean, it is shocking. Yeah. So this is where we are at with film. And so it really is up to us to, mm -hmm. to uh, manage systems. We have people, even on the continent of Africa, we have people who are fabulously wealthy. Yep. who need to start investing in that kind of enterprise. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think they are aware that their wealth comes from a particular system, which is controlled from particular locations, mainly in the United States, but also elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to, to rock that boat, so they're not going to do it. Right. Yes, so uh, what was the last question? <laughs> um, speaking quickly about, about wealth, wealth only functions to generate more wealth. So it's very hard to get wealthy people to fund things that are not immediately formulaic and uh, immediately going to generate profit. So that's always the challenge I find uh, with funding, uh, funding stuff, you know. Uh, my last question was, uh, uh, was just following up on a conversation we had two years ago, which was published in Bomb Magazine. Uh, and you said you were working on uh, speculative fiction uh, for a young adult audience. Um, is this is this coming soon? And what do you hope to accomplish from switching to a different audience and this different form? What I hope to accomplish is to enable me to speak more directly to African youth. I think that not many people are thinking of having literary conversations with African youth. And for me, again, it's always important to 
think about African youth in their environment now. And I felt that speculative fiction would give me the freedom to do that in ways that I think I can tell stories that will be useful. So that's why I have switched to speculative. The situation in Zimbabwe is just so absurd that it is very difficult to write it in any kind of realist narrative. Um, I know I've been trying and it, it's really been very difficult for me. So that's one reason. Um, I also think that possibly uh, other adult fiction that I write that is set in Zimbabwe or places like Zimbabwe will also at least have speculative elements in it that is adult fiction. I think it'll just enable me to tell the stories that I need to tell. In terms of um, uh, when it is going to appear, well, I was not able to obtain the inputs that I had hoped to obtain all that time ago. And so um, it, it, it is not as near as I would have hoped it to be. Okay, that's okay. You've been busy and uh, we will wait for it. Thank you so much, Sitsi Dangaremba, for joining us today for Book Rising. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Bhakti. It's been a wonderful conversation.